Hello, welcome to lecture 17, which is called Moment of Inertia. In this lecture, we're going to talk about rotational motion, center of mass, so we'll do some calculations to find the center of mass, the moment of inertia, and we'll also use the parallel axis theorem. So you'll see what all of that is about. Um, if we look at all of the different types of problems we've done in the course so far, we are finished kinematics. Okay, so we've been through kinematics already. So that's all done. Um, forces, we did linear and circular forces. Today we're going to take a look at rotational forces, so forces that cause an object to rotate. Um, and that's called a torque. So we're going to be looking at torques here today. Okay, and that's what's coming up um, in this lecture and the next. Uh, we did momentum already, but we've so far only talked about linear momentum. We haven't talked about rotational momentum yet, so that will come later. Uh, we've done energy and work, and we've looked at different types of energy, kinetic energy, potential energy. We looked at translational kinetic energy, or we've just called it kinetic energy. Later we'll see that there's another type of kinetic energy that is rotational. We looked at gravitational potential energy, elastic potential energy, so these ones down here, so we've done that already. And in all cases we've been near the surface of the earth, but when we get to the end of the course we will not be near the surface of the earth, and that's how we'll finish it off. Okay, today we're going to focus on rotational forces, so forces that cause objects to rotate, um, and we'll take a look at what torque means. Okay, all right, so let's talk a little bit about rotational motion. So far, if you remember, when we're drawing free body diagrams, we've always treated objects like they're just little particles, so we've drawn them as little dots. Um, on a free body diagram, but there are situations where the shape and the size of the object does have an impact on its motion. So we define a rigid body as an object that has a size and a shape that doesn't change as it moves. So it's rigid, meaning it's solid, and as it moves, so maybe it's a wheel on or a tire on a bike, a wheel on a bike or a tire in a car or something, and as it's rolling, right we're assuming that its shape and size does not change as it's moving so there's three types of motion of a rigid body translation so translation translation just means sliding or shifting so things going left and right or up and down or on some sort of angle okay so translating just means sliding or shifting rotation so that means that you're rotating it could be rotating clockwise or counterclockwise but it's rotating, okay? And then there's the third type, which is a combination, of, a combination of translation and rotation. So an example of this is, let's say we have um, a wheel and it's rolling down a hill. So as it's rolling down the hill, you notice that the whole wheel, it's translating, so it's moving down the hill, but it's also rotating at the same time. So its center of mass is moving as it's traveling down the hill, but it's also rotating, okay? So translation just means sliding or shifting left and right. So maybe it's something like a particle or a block that's just sliding down the hill, okay? So a slide, um, a block sliding down a ramp. A rotation might be a wheel, but it's fixed. So it's not able to move, it's not able to translate or shift left and right or up and down. It's only just rotating in one spot. And then translation and rotation, it's translating, so moving down the ramp and rotating as it does so. Okay, so a bit of a recall from the past. Angular velocity is the symbol that looks like a fancy W, it's called omega, of an object is the rate at which the object rotates. So the units for angular velocity are radians per second. Okay, those are the SI units, okay? But revolutions per minute, which is also called RPM, or revolutions per second, they're also units for angular velocity, they're just not SI units, so we can always convert if we wanted to. Angular acceleration, the symbol for that is alpha over here, is the rate at which the angular velocity changes. So the omega, it's the rate of change of, of angular velocity with respect to time. And the SI units are radians per second squared. Okay. So remember that we had three linear kinematic equations. I'll write them out over here. We had S final 
equals S initial plus V initial delta T plus one half A delta T squared. And then we had V final equals V initial plus A delta T. And then the third one was V final squared equals V initial squared plus two A delta S. So these are the three linear kinematic equations that we started off in the course with. Then we said, okay, you can change all the linear um, variables, kinematic variables, to angular variables. All we did was for each of these um, terms, we are using the fact that S is equal to theta times R, and V is equal to omega times R, and A is equal to alpha times R. So if we take each of these terms in each of the equations, let me change my color, and we say, okay, I'm going to divide everything by R. Each term I'm dividing by R, and whatever I do to the left side of the equation, I have to do to the right side. So I'm dividing every term by R, so I'm not really changing anything. But if I rearrange this equation, S over R, that's theta, and V over R is omega and A over R is alpha. So that means that when I take a look at each of these terms, this one over here is S over R, which is where I get my theta from over here. It's S final, so that becomes theta final. SI over R over here becomes theta initial because it was S initial. And then VI over R over here, that becomes omega I. And then A over R over here becomes alpha. So you see how all the variables that are linear could be converted into angular variables. And we can do that with all the equations. We divide everything by R and the angular version, I mean the linear versions become the angular version. Okay, so that's how we're getting these equations. By convention, we talked about how the angular velocity and acceleration are positive if they point in the counterclockwise direction, okay? The opposite direction that a clock moves, which would be going that way. Negative if they point in the clockwise direction, which would be going that way. All right, so now let's fill in the blanks with the words positive and negative. 1A, an object is rotating clockwise so it's going clockwise, so that means it's going in the negative direction. And it's speeding up. So its angular velocity is negative because it's going clockwise. And it's speeding up, so it's getting faster and faster in the negative direction. So its angular acceleration is negative. Okay. When the velocity and the acceleration are both in the same direction, that means it speeds up. So they're both in the negative direction, causing it to speed up, okay? An object is rotating clockwise, all right? So clockwise, so that means its angular velocity is negative because it's rotating clockwise in the negative direction, but it's slowing down. So because it's slowing down, then that means that the velocity and the angular acceleration have to be pointing in opposite directions. It's um, rotating clockwise, which means its velocity is negative, but its angular acceleration would be positive because it has to go in the opposite direction to make it slow down. Okay, see, an object is rotating counterclockwise. So right away, that means that its angular velocity is positive because we said by convention, counterclockwise is positive. And it's speeding up. So it's speeding up, that means its angular acceleration must be in the same direction as its angular velocity, so it's also positive. An object is rotating counterclockwise. Again, that means its angular velocity is positive, but it's slowing down this time. So that means its angular acceleration must be in the opposite direction, so angular acceleration would be clockwise, which is negative. Okay, an object is rotating counterclockwise. Again, that means angular velocity is positive because it's counterclockwise. By convention, that's positive direction. And it's moving at a constant rate. So what's its angular acceleration in this case? What does it mean when it's moving in a, at a constant rate? That means that the velocity is constant. It's not changing. So that means the angular acceleration is zero. Okay. 
because acceleration means how fast is the velocity changing over time. Angular acceleration just means how fast is the angular velocity changing over time. If it's constant, then it's not changing at all. Okay. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about center of mass. Okay, so if you tried to balance a ruler by holding it up with just one finger, where would you put your finger on the ruler in order to balance it? Would you put your finger on this end? Would you put your finger on this end? No, of course not. You want to balance the ruler. And you're, we're assuming that the ruler has um, a uniform mass throughout its length. So you would put your finger right in the middle, right? So right in the middle here, that's where you would want to put your finger. Now, would it be on the bottom or on the top? No, because if you put it on the bottom or the top, it's just going to fall over. You would try to put your finger right in the middle. Okay, so that point right there is called the center of mass. It's the balancing point of the ruler. What if you tried to balance a hammer by holding it up with just one finger? Where would you put your finger so you could balance it? Would you still just put your finger right in the middle? Well, what's different between this hammer and the ruler is with the ruler, we're assuming that the mass is spread out uniformly through the ruler. We don't have a heavy end and a light end. But with the hammer, we can look at it and say, well, there's a lot more metal on this side of the hammer. And so on that end, it's going to be heavier than on the other end. So where should we put our finger to balance it. Should we put it closer to the heavy end or should we put it closer to the light end? Okay, so imagine you're doing this and try it out if you have to, but you would have to put your finger closer to the heavy end, okay, in order to balance. Okay, so in this case, the center of mass of this hammer is somewhere closer to the heavier end of the hammer. Okay, what if you threw an object like an axe so that it would spin in the air? about which point would the axe rotate? So would it rotate about the center point? Well, no, again, just like the hammer, it has a heavy end closer to, to one side compared to the other side. We've got a heavy point right here. So just like where you would wanna balance it, the same idea you can imagine if you were to throw this object, where would it spin, okay? And you could click on this link and see what this looks like. So this video is showing that we have a bunch of objects that are being thrown, okay? And you can see that the location of where they rotate is actually the center of their mass. Okay, so it's hard to see right now, but what happens when we use black lights so that the center of mass is more visible? Okay, the center of mass is painted orange. So you can see it's rotating the object the object is rotating and that center of mass is showing right now. So you can see exactly where it is um, rotating about the center of mass. Okay, now we have this disc. The center of mass is at the center of the object. We rotate it. Oh, it doesn't look like the center of mass is at the center of the object, but now that's the center of mass. So the center of the object is not necessarily the center of mass. So look, it's not in a nice smooth motion right now. It's kind of wobbling back and forth. And that's because it's the center of the object. But the center of mass is a nice smooth toss here. So it almost looks like it's just a particle. It's rotating about its center of mass. And so the center of mass looks like it's just a particle right now when you don't see anything else because it's all blacked out. Okay, so if we want to actually calculate the center of mass, it's the mass weighted center of the object. So if we want to calculate the center of mass, it's just the mass weighted center of the object. Here's the formula that we can use to find the x component 
of the center of mass and the y component of the center of mass. It looks a little tricky right now. It's what we're really doing is finding the mass app, the mass weighted average or the weighted average. Think about if you had different marks in a course, but they're all worth different weights. So you might have tests and final exam and quizzes, but they all have different weights. So if you wanted to find your average mark in the course, you wouldn't just find the average of all of your, your um, tests or assessments. You would have to weight them all so that they're all weighted appropriately according to the syllabus. Well, this is kind of what we're doing with the center of mass, except we have to do it twice, once with the x component, once with the y component. Okay, the first thing that you want to do is make sure that you have an x and y axis labeled. So question two here, it already includes our x axis and our y axis here. So the four masses shown in the figure are connected by massless rigid rods. Find the coordinates of the center of mass. Assume all masses and distances are significant to three digits. Okay, and the answer is posted here so that you can verify your answer. Okay, so what we're doing first is we're going to find the x component of the center of mass and we'll use the formula that's shown m1x1 plus m2x2 plus m3x3. Now there's four different objects here, and instead of doing using one, two, and three, we really should just be using what they're using in the picture, which is A, B, C, D. So let's just do that right away. M, A, X, A, M, B, X, B, M, three will be M, C, X, C, and then we have a fourth one, D, M, D, X, D. Okay, so we do this as many times as we have objects over all the masses put together. So we have mass of A plus mass of B plus mass of C plus mass of D. Okay, so here's all my objects. All right, so what do we do now? So let's find all of the points for each of these objects. For, so for point A, we're imagining this is like my y-axis here and this is our x-axis. So how would we name this point here at A? it's really right at the origin. So A would just be zero comma zero. Okay, what about for this point here at B? How would you name that? So the X component is zero and the Y is eight centimeters because that's the distance from here to here. So that's also the distance from here to here, eight centimeters. Okay, so now we can choose, do we want to change everything to kilograms and meters or do we just want to leave them in grams and centimeters? It really doesn't matter. What you'll notice in the equation is on the bottom you have masses, so all the masses when you add them all up, whatever the units are, are going to stay the same when you add them. So let's say we keep it in grams, that's all going to be grams. And on the top you're going to have a bunch of masses multiplied by all the x values. So if you keep these masses as grams and the x values as centimeters, then when you add them all up you'll get grams times centimeters over grams. Grams will cancel out and your answer will be in centimeters. And that's fine to have your answer in centimeters. So that's what we'll do. If you don't like doing that, you can always change everything to be in meters and kilograms because those are the SI units, but it's not necessary to do that, to convert. Okay, so I'm gonna put in everything that I know here. So my mass of object A is um, 100 grams. My X value, okay, that's the X value of object A is zero, plus my mass of object B, which is up here 200 grams, times my X value. Well, what's this point over here? It's zero comma eight centimeters, but the x value is the first one, which is 0, plus mass of object C, which is this one here, 200 grams, times this point over here, if I were to label it, would be the x value is 10, comma, the y value is 8. So my x value for C is 10, so it's always the first number, plus mass of D, which is this one over here, 200, times my X value, so this point for D would be 10 comma zero. So it'd be 10 is the X component. All over, all the masses added up together. 100 for A, 200 for B, 200 for C, and 200 for D. So I can just 
type all of that on, onto my calculator and I should get 5.71. And remember the units on the top were the mass, which we left in grams, times the x value, which was in centimeters. And on the bottom um, was all the masses. So again, that's in grams because we left it like that. The grams cancel out and we're just left with centimeters. Okay, remember when you add and the units are all the same, the units just stay the same. So this would be like grams times centimeters, grams times centimeters, grams times centimeters, and so on. All of these are just grams times centimeters. So when you add them, just like if you were to add x plus x plus x, the x's, you don't do anything to them, they just stay as x. So this is just saying as grams um, times centimeters, and on the bottom, again, we have grams plus grams plus grams plus grams is just still grams. So the grams cancel out. So that's the x value of the center of mass. So we can do the same thing to find the y value of the center of mass. Same equation except with y's instead. m a y a plus m b times y b plus m c times y c plus m d times y d. All over all your masses added together. M A plus M B plus M C plus M D. And we can plug everything in. So my mass of A is 100 grams. I'll put the units in. Times the Y value. So now we're looking at the Y component. Still zero for A. Plus my mass of B, which is 200 grams. And for zero, maybe I'll even put the unit in for that one. So it's in centimeters, even though it's zero. I'll put that in plus my mass of B, which was 200 grams, times the Y value now of that point, which was eight centimeters, plus my mass of C, which is 200 grams, times my Y value, which is eight centimeters again, plus my mass of D, which is 200 grams, times zero centimeters. All over, all the masses again added together. 100 grams plus 200 grams plus 200 grams plus 200 grams. And when I calculate all of this on my calculator, I get 4.57. Again, the grams cancel out and I'm, and I'm just left with centimeters. Okay, so my center of mass is at the x component is 5.71 centimeters comma the y is 4.57 centimeters all right does this make sense let's take a look at the drawing so remember we said if we are going to balance something you'd always put your finger closer to the heavier side well over here we have a light side it's only 100 grams and then we have our bigger masses over here so we would expect the center of mass to be somewhere near the middle, but closer to the heavier side. So it would be closer to the top versus the bottom and closer to the right versus the left. So maybe somewhere around here. Well, what did we get? 5.71, which is more than halfway because halfway would have been five over here. So we're a little bit more, 5.71 centimeters and 4.57, which is a little bit more than halfway because half would be at four. We're at 4.57. So our point is right here, closer to the heavier ends of the, the, um, the object over here. Okay, so that makes sense. All right, let's look at the next question. Moment of inertia. So the symbol for moment of inertia is I. Okay, moment of inertia is I is a measure of an object's tendency to resist angular acceleration. Okay, so picture I as though it's something that makes it hard for an object to rotate. Just like acceleration, okay, what was it that made it hard for something to accelerate? Well, remember, if, if we looked at the equation F net equals MA, if the F net was constant, what is it that makes it harder to accelerate an object? It's, it's mass. If the mass is heavy, if it's a really big mass, 
okay? Then it would be harder to accelerate the object. So I'm pushing on a piano with the same force as I'm pushing on a book, and my piano is not accelerating the way my book is because it has a bigger mass, okay? So the mass of an object is telling us how hard it is to accelerate the object. Just like the moment of inertia of an object, I, is telling us how hard it is to rotate an object, okay? Resisting angular acceleration means how hard is it to rotate the object, okay? If the eye is big, it's gonna be really hard to rotate the object. If the eye is small, it'll be easier to rotate the object. The higher the moment of inertia is, the more difficult it is to rotate the object. The moment of inertia depends on the axis of rotation. Okay, this will make a little bit more sense as we do some examples. It's the sum of the products of the mass of each particle in the body and the square of its distance from the axis of rotation. Okay, so here's the formula. I equals m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared plus m3 r3 squared, and so on. When we find the moment of inertia, we want the units to be in kilograms times meters squared. Okay, so those are the units. That means that when we calculate it, we do want to convert units to be mass in kilograms and R to be in meters. So that when we multiply them, we get kilograms times meters and then the R is squared, so it'd be squared. Okay, so let's remember for moment of inertia, we do want to convert the units. So let's look at this example. We have four masses shown in the figure and they're connected by a massless rigid lot rods, just like the other example. This time, instead of asking us for the center of mass, we want the moment of inertia about an axis that passes through mass A. So imagine that there is um, a rod that's going right through mass A into the, your screen. Okay, so it's going right into the screen right now. So it's coming towards me and into my screen. And I'm trying to rotate the whole object. So now you can imagine this whole object is rotating around this rod that's going into the screen. So it's going all the way around like that. Okay, so that would have a different moment of inertia compared to something that's rotating about a point, let's say over here. So if I'm rotating about a point over there, the whole thing is rotating kind of like this instead. Okay, it's easier to rotate things about a point in the center than it is about a point on the end. So imagine trying to rotate something about the center, the objects don't need to move very far. Whereas if I'm rotating about a point on the end, like in this example, everything is moving a lot farther in that case. Okay, so let's calculate what the moment of inertia would be in this case. So we're using this formula I equals m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared plus m3 r3 squared. In this case, we have four different masses. And instead of one, two, three, again, I'm gonna use a, b, c, and d. So I'm gonna write I equals mass of object a, r, a squared, plus mass of object b, r, b squared, plus mass of c, r, c squared, plus mass of d, r, d squared. Okay, so mass of A, 100 grams. We wanna change it to kilograms. So we would divide it by 100, I mean by 1,000, and we would get 0 0.1 kilograms times RA. So RA refers to the distance between object A and the axis of rotation. So we said that we're rotating about an axis that passes right through mass A. So RA is the distance from object A to its axis of rotation, which is at A. So the distance between those two would be zero. And that I'll write in meters squared. Plus mass B. Mass B is 200 grams. I'll change it to kilograms, 0 0.2 kilograms. Times RB, which is the distance from R, I mean from B, to the axis of rotation, which they said was through mass A. So the distance from B to this axis of rotation, which is eight centimeters. We'll change it to meters, 0 0.08 meters, and it's squared. Plus mass C, mass C is 200 grams, change it to kilograms, 0.2 kilograms, times the distance between C 
and the axis of rotation. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so what is the distance between C and the axis of rotation, which is at A? Well, we know this is eight centimeters and this is 10 centimeters. We're just looking for this hypotenuse here. So we can use Pythagorean theorem. So what do we get here? So I'll change them both to be meters right away. So I have 0 0.08 meters and 0 0.1 meters. And I'll label these as my A, B, and C. And my formula for Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I'm solving for c, so I'll just rewrite it as c equals the square root of a squared plus b squared. And my a is 0 0.08, and my b is 0 0.1 squared on the square root sign. So that's my distance from a to c. But then I want to also square that because of the equation. So when I square it, the square root and the square will cancel out. So I end up just getting 0 0.08 squared plus 0 0.1 squared. Okay, and I'm just going to leave it like that for now because I'm going to type it all in my calculator later. Mass of D, 200 grams, change it to kilograms, 0 0.2 kilograms. Oh, all of this was in meters and this was kilograms and then times by rd, which is the distance from d to the axis of rotation, so it's this distance right here, 10 centimeters, which is 0 0.1 meters. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so that's 0 0.1 meters. And now I can just type all of this up. So 0.1 times 0 squared plus 0.2 times 0 0.08 squared, plus 0.2 times 0 0.8 squared plus 0 0.1 squared, all in brackets, plus 0.2 times 0.1, then I get 0 0.00656, and my units are kilograms, meters, squared. Okay, so for two objects that have the same mass, the object that has the mass that's closer to the center is easier to rotate. Okay, let's watch this quick video here. This equation tells us that the moment of inertia equals mass times distance squared. This means the further the mass is away from the center of rotation, the more force is going to be needed to make it move. I have these two long bars that are attached to a center pin. Now both of those bars are able to rotate around this position, but the first bar has a lead weight that's attached very close to the center of rotation. The second bar has the same lead weight, but it's placed at a much further distance away from the center of rotation. So what I want to do is I want to attach this to a table. We're going to lift them up and release them and observe what happens. Now gravity is applying the same force to both weights. As we clearly see, the object closer to the center of rotation will accelerate quicker around its axis. Now let's apply this to objects that roll. These are two standard objects that are sold by science companies. We see that the one that has more mass in the center rolls a little bit quicker. I want to add a third object here. The ball has more of its mass towards the center than the cylinder does, so it's going to accelerate even quicker. Here are a few homemade pieces that share the same principle. They weigh the same, only the mass is located at different positions. I think this one shares it the best, so let's try it. Now, if I want to feel this moment of inertia on a large scale, I have these two wooden blocks attached to this meter stick. And if I hold it here in the center, I can turn it back and forth very quickly. It doesn't require much effort. But I want to move the blocks to the outside. Yeah. Tighten them down. Now in one rotation, these blocks would be covering a much bigger circle, so I've increased the moment of inertia. Now if I try and turn it, <laughs> you see it's going much slower. It's much harder to turn. It requires more torque simply because I've increased the distance that they must travel as I rotate it around the center of my hand. All right. So there's going to be a table that you see on your formula sheet, on your tests and on your exam, um, and it looks just like this, 
okay? So these are the moments of inertia that are provided to you on formula sheet. Uh, notice that for a given mass, the farther the mass is from the axis of rotation, the larger the moment of inertia is. Therefore, it's harder to rotate the object, okay? So just like in that video we watched, when you try to rotate something from a point that is farther away from um, where the mass is, it's harder to rotate it, okay? So here we look at the formulas for the moments of inertia. Okay, so here we have two identical shapes, a thin rod, okay? But notice that the moment of inertia when you rotate it about its center over here is 1 12th times its mass times its length squared, whereas when you rotate it about its end, now you're making it move farther when you try to rotate this. So it's harder to rotate it. And instead of it being 1 12th ml squared, it's now 1 3rd ml squared. It's four times as big as it used to be because you're rotating it from the end, okay? Same thing when you look at a planar slab, when you're rotating it about its center here, it's 1 12th mass times A, so this width over here squared. But when you rotate it about its edge, now the mass is farther away from the axis of rotation, and so it's four times the size, the moment of inertia that it used to be. So now it's one third m a squared instead of one twelfth. Okay, so it got bigger. You don't have to know these numbers off by heart. This formula, um, this will be given to you on your formula sheet. Okay, what about if we look at these objects here? So we have different shapes. We saw a little bit of this as an example in the video. We have cylinders or disks that are rotating about their center. Okay, so this is a cylinder. It's a disc, it's solid, okay? Then we have another one that's rotating about its center as well, but this is a uh, hoop. So notice if we were to compare these two, let's say they have the exact same mass as each other. But notice that the mass here is closer to the center or the axis of rotation, whereas in the cylindrical hoop that's hollow, the mass is farther away. There's no mass that's in the center over here. It's all kind of farther away from the center. Okay, so notice the two moments of inertia. When we have a solid cylinder or solid disc, the moment of inertia is one half times its mass times radius squared. Whereas if it's a hoop, okay, so it's like empty in the middle, it's just a uh, disc but it's hollow inside so they call it a hoop it's mr squared so notice it's two times as big okay what about a sphere if we have a solid sphere the mass let's pretend this mass is the same as the other two masses they're all the same mass and the radius is the same but notice that the mass is closer to the axis of rotation for the solid sphere compared to the disc or the hoop and so because of that, this is 2 over 5, which is 0 0.4 mr squared, smaller than 0 0.5 mr squared, which we see here. Okay, so this one is the smallest out of all of them. And then we have mr squared, this one is the largest of all of them. And then if we have a, a sphere, but it's hollow inside. So like maybe think about what a basketball would look like. It just has the skin around it, but it's hollow full of air on the inside. So in that case, if assuming the mass and the radius are still the same as the other cases, but it's hollow inside. So that means that the mass is farther away from the axis of rotation. And because of that, we end up with two thirds. So about 0 0.67 mr squared. Okay, so notice that this one's bigger. So we have 0 0.5 mr squared. We have one mr squared over here. That's the biggest. We have 0 0.4 mr squared for the solid sphere. And we have 0 0.67 mr squared. Okay, so we can compare these different shapes and say, well, which one, if they were all the same mass and the radiuses were all the same, then which one is easier to rotate? So the one with the smaller, um, I value over here. The moment of inertia that's the smallest means it can rotate easier. So that would be this, the um, solid sphere because 0 0.4 mr squared is smaller than any of the other ones. So this one is easier to rotate. Easiest to rotate means that it will have an angular acceleration that's the 
the biggest. So it's the highest angular acceleration, which is alpha. That means that if you were to roll all of these in a race down a ramp, let's say, so let's say you have all these different shapes and they're all going down a ramp, which one would get there fastest? Well, the one that can rotate faster is the one that's gonna make it fastest, the one with the biggest angular acceleration. So that would be the solid sphere. So it would be first place. Okay, what would be second place? So 0 0.4 mr squared, the next one would be 0 0.5 mr squared. This would be second place. Okay, and then what would be third place? So we have 0 0.67 versus 1 mr squared. So 0 0.67 is the next one. So the smaller the moment of inertia is, the easier it is to rotate. So the bigger the angular acceleration will be, the faster it will go down that ramp. Okay, so this would be third place. And finally, the one that has the biggest moment of inertia is last place. Okay. All right, so now that should help us with this next question. So a uniform disk, so that means a solid disk. A uniform hoop, so that means it's empty on the inside, it's just like a shell, like kind of like a ring. And a uniform solid sphere are all released at the same time at the top of an inclined ramp. Okay, they all roll without slipping, so they're all rolling down this ramp. Okay, they go down and around, all the way down which one gets there first, which one gets there second, which one gets there third, okay? So we already said that. The one that has the smallest moment of inertia will get there first because it's easier to rotate it. So the uniform solid sphere, that's first place. So that's the one that gets down to the bottom first. The uniform disc, the solid one, that's second place. And the uniform hoop, that has the biggest moment of inertia. That's the one that was just one MR squared. And this one will be last. Okay, so the order is first the solid sphere, then the disc, and then the hoop. Okay. All right, the next topic is the parallel axis theorem. So we already talked about the moment of inertia and how it depends on the axis of rotation. So when you rotate something from a different axis, so when you move the axis of rotation, it's gonna change the moment of inertia. If the axis of rotation is right at the center of mass, that's when the moment of inertia is at its smallest, that it can be for that object. But as you move it away from the center of mass, now your mass is farther away, and so you end up getting a bigger uh, moment of inertia because it's harder to rotate something about a point that's farther away from its mass. So you can use the parallel axis theorem to find um, the moment of inertia about an axis that's different from the center of mass. So if it's not at the center of mass, you can calculate it with this parallel axis theorem. And this is the formula for it, so let's use this to figure out how it all works. So use the moment of inertia of a thin rod about its center to determine the moment of inertia of a thin rod about its end. So let's go back to that table. So this is the moment of inertia of a thin rod about its center. It's one third ml squared. And we wanna know how do we use this to figure out what is the moment of inertia of a thin rod about its end. So we wanna derive this equation ourselves. So 1 12th ml squared. So if we kind of imagine what this looks like again, this length was L, and originally the moment of inertia about its center of mass was 1 12th ml squared. But now we're trying to find, well, what's the moment of inertia when we rotate this rod about its end instead? Okay, so we're not just spinning it around like this. We're spinning it around about its end, which means the whole rod is moving, kind of like, see how it's rotating? All the way around. 
So we're rotating about this point. Okay, so we're trying to find the moment of inertia and because we're rotating about a point that's farther away from the center of mass, we should expect to get a bigger value for the, for the moment of inertia. So let's use this formula. I, so the moment of inertia at some other point that's not at the center of mass is equal to the moment of inertia when the axis of rotation is at the center of mass plus the mass of the object times d squared, where d is the distance from the center of mass to the axis of rotation. Okay, so they're telling us we want to move it so that it's now its new axis of rotation is now over here on its end. Okay, so we want it to be rotating about its end. Okay, so let's calculate this. The I of the center of mass is what we knew from the table is 1 12th ml squared plus the mass of the object, still m, times d squared. Well, d is the distance from the center of mass to the location where the new axis of rotation is. So this distance over here. That's what our d is. Okay, so we don't know any numbers from this diagram, but we do know that the length of the whole thing is called l. So what is the value of d then? So d is exactly half of l, because it used to be at the center of the rod, and now it's on the end of the rod. So d is the same as just one half l, or l over two. So I'm replacing d with l over 2, and I have to keep this squared here, so I'll put squared. And now all we're doing is simplifying this expression. So I have 1 12th ml squared plus l squared over 2 squared is 1 4th ml squared. Now I can use common denominators to add these two fractions. They are like terms, I just need to multiply this one by 3, by 3, so I have 1 ml squared over 12 plus 3 ml squared over 12. So that would be 4 ml squared over 12, and 4 ml squared over 12 is the same as we can just reduce the 4 and the 12 becomes 1 3rd. I'll just put it in right here. 1 3rd ml squared. And we look, if we look at the table, we'll see that we're right. It is 1 3rd ml squared, and that's where that equation comes from. Okay, on a test you'll be asked to do this, but it won't be with something that you can see from the table, it will be something different. Okay, so let's do this one. Number six, find the moment of inertia of a solid disc about a point on its outer circumference. Okay, so let's just draw a picture of our disc. So let's say this is our disc. We'll use the table to figure out what the moment of inertia is about the center of mass. So when we go back, solid disk is this first one over here and it is already at the center of mass the axis of rotation is going right through the center of its mass and it's one half mr squared so that is i center of mass is one half m r squared okay but we don't want to know what it is at the center of mass we want to know what the moment of inertia is about a point on its outer circumference so that means that the axis of rotation is now somewhere on its outer circumference, okay? So we know that this is the radius here. So that's what the distance is that, um, the, the distance between the center of mass and the axis of rotation is. So if we use the same formula as before, I equals I at the center of mass plus MD squared the moment of inertia at the center of mass is 1 half m, m r squared plus m and the d is just r in this case because it's the distance from the center of mass to the axis of rotation which is on the edge. So it would be m d which is now r squared. So we have 1 half m r squared plus m r squared Again, we can just look at common denominators, mr squared plus 
we can say this is 2 over 2 mr squared so that our denominators are the same and now we can add these up we get 1 half plus 2 over 2 so 1 plus 2 is 3 over 2 mr squared so notice the moment of inertia when you rotate a disc about the center of mass used to be 1 half mr squared now it's 3 over 2 mr squared so it got three times bigger Okay, it's a lot harder to rotate something about a point on its edge compared to a point that it's at its center of mass. And the farther away the axis of rotation is from the, the bulk of the mass, the harder it is to rotate. All right, so that was the last question. I hope that was helpful. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.